Hello and greetings from Philadelphia and the University of Pennsylvania. My name is Christina Burton. I'm the Senior Associate Director of Graduate Admissions here at Penn Engineering. We thank you all for being here to learn more about our programs, specifically our master's programs in Computer and Information Science, Computer and Information Technology, and Data Science. I just want to let you all know that this session will be recorded and we will later post it to our Graduate Admissions YouTube channel. Just give me a second and I will share screen so that we can get started. So today's event is sponsored by Penn Engineering Graduate Admissions, but as I mentioned, you will learn about our master's programs in computer science, computer and information technology, and data science. Before we get started, I'd like to welcome our Associate Dean of Graduate Programs, Dr. Boon Thao Lu, who will provide welcoming remarks. Thank you, Christina. I hope all of you can hear me fine. Uh, it's great to see so many of you on Zoom today. Uh, I'll start off by saying that this has been a really exciting semester at Penn Engineering. We welcome back all our students. Um, we are teaching in-person classes. Um, I'm teaching a class to 180 students right now. Um, the university as a whole has handled the COVID situation very well. Um, we have a mask mandate, a vaccine mandate, and um, regular testing among students. And as a result, if you go on to our Penn website, you can see that the COVID case count is very low. And we are one of the success stories among universities able to bring lots of students back together, have high quality education, um, while making sure that your safety is um, at, at the top of our priority. Um, this is also a really exciting time to join Penn Engineering because one of the things we learned through the COVID crisis is the importance of science and engineering. The, the, uh, as all of you may know, the mRNA vaccine was developed at Penn um, and it's not just a triumph in life science research, but it's also an engineering triumph in terms of manufacturing, vaccine delivering and data science. And to propel us forward into the future, uh, Penn, our university has recently announced a $100 million initiative in precision, precision engineering in health technologies, bringing together our engineering school and also our School of Medicine. So it's never a more exciting time to join us. And I hope that you will apply um, and be able to see you here um, th this coming fall. I've also wanted to remark on the resilience of Penn throughout the whole uh, pandemic. Uh, uh, while we transition to online, the whole community has kept very close together. I also note that our students uh, throughout the entire pandemic have been able to continue to get jobs. Um, I think this is testament to the strength of our program and also the marketability of our students. And things can only get better as the economy rebound. And as this is really the perfect time to further your education, uh, to propel your career forward. The last thing I want to add is that uh, over the last year, we have witnessed a change in US policies towards international students. Many of our international students from China, from India and all over the world are able to get visas very quickly the doors of the United States are open again. Um, we welcome all international students to apply. And the diversity is really one of the key strengths of the United States and you continue to be so. Um, with that said, um, we have a really exciting agenda ahead. So I'm gonna hand it back to Christina uh, who can introduce uh, our program directors and coordinators. Thank you, Dr. Liu. So we have quite an agenda for you today. I hope that you all will have most of your programmatic questions answered. So thank you, Dr. Liu, for providing welcoming remarks. Next, we will hear from the program administrator as well as the uh, faculty director for computer and information science, 
who will share an overview about that master's program, as well as the master's program for computer and information technology. Thanks, Christina. So I think Radian's having some trouble joining the link. So I think he was planning to present, but I can present instead. Uh, should I share my screen or do you have a slide? I don't know what's easier. Yes, you do have permission to share a screen, but if you need me to, I'm happy to do so. Sure. Maybe if you do that, that might be easier. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Christina. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet all of you. Uh, so my name is Swapnil Shet. I'm the director of the CIS MSc program. And Radian, who I think is having some trouble joining, should be here soon. He's uh, one of our wonderful coordinators and he helps with CIS, with CGGT and MCIT. So I think when he comes, he can uh, chime in as well. But I can get started with some of the CIS MSc stuff. So a few things in terms of like, what the program is. So this is what I would think of as our traditional masters in CS program. So we generally expect that people have a background in computer science or something related as far as their undergrad is concerned. Uh, if it's something close, that's generally fine. Something like computer engineering, electrical engineering, that tends to be okay. Uh, in general, what you can do as part of the CIS program is we have a large number of courses in the department that you can take I'll get into some of the core courses and so on in a second, but you can take a lot of different courses. We've been growing our department a lot over the last few years. So there are a lot of new faculty. You can get involved in research and there are a lot of different areas in computer science that you could work with. In terms of our requirements, you can sort of see this on the slides and I can get into more details if people are interested, but essentially the way it works is it's 10 courses, four of them are core, three CS electives and then three CS or non-CS electives. So while, of course, we are very proud of the fact that the CS department is very strong, there are a lot of other departments at Penn that are very strong as well. So this includes other engineering departments, it includes the college, it includes Wharton. So you are allowed to take some courses from other departments and that I think is a strength of our program. In addition to this, you can do research with various faculties. So there are options to do things like thesis or independent study. And that's a popular option for a lot of students if they are interested in that. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, thanks. So in terms of MCIT, let me see if Radian is here. Otherwise, I can sort of talk about MCIT as well. Yeah, actually, uh, Christina, Radian is here. Could you promote him to the panelists? Thanks. Hey, Radian, do you want to talk about MCIT? Hello, everyone. This is Radian Purdue, coordinator for uh, CIS and MCIT. I apologize for my delay. I was having some technical issues with the, uh, the Zoom link. Um, very glad to be here and glad to have you all in this session. Um, yeah, I would definitely love to talk about this. So. Uh, Swap, I just got into here. Did you already talk about CIS? Yeah, I just okay. talked about CIS. So if you want to just take over for MCIT and then the rest of the presentation, that'll be great. And I can chime in if needed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so MCIT, uh, Computer Information Technology is a 10 credit program. Uh, this program is designed for students who do not have any uh, computer science backgrounds. Uh, what's unique about this program is we have students from all different specialties and areas of uh, higher education. So we have uh, mostly they come in from engineering, about 60 to 70 percent, such as uh, uh, physical sciences or economics. We have business majors. Uh, we also have some interesting majors out there, such as music, uh, uh, piano major we've seen. We've seen uh, psychological majors too, um, history majors. So uh, the program really is designed, again, for students who don't have any computer science background. Um, there's, there are 10 courses in the program. Students start with their uh, six core courses first. 
So these are courses such as programming, uh, data structures, theory, math, algorithm, hardware systems. Um, students typically, in most cases, they, they would pursue the program with three courses per semester. So that would be uh, CIT 591, 592, and 593 in the fall semester, and then following the other three CIT courses in the spring semester. And then in the second year, students uh, pursue their, uh, their electives. So in this program, students have to have three computer science uh, graduate elective courses, and then one course can be a non-CIS elective. Uh, we have a uh, very um, helpful uh, resource, which is the list of electives uh, on the link right here. Uh, students can view uh, all the electives that we have in this program, such as electives from Wharton, from School of Education, Finance. Um, and we typically do update this list every semester. So students will have more options as we go into uh, every academic year. Um, okay, awesome. So, uh, and by, by the way, who's uh, managing the slides? Christina, is that you? Okay, yes. awesome. Thank you, Christina. Um, the uh, the full-time, part-time status. So students ask about this um, a lot when it comes to registration, when it comes to starting the program. Uh, so domestic students uh, or U.S. citizen students who are in the U.S., so they have the option to do the program part-time or full-time. Uh, international students, due to the visa and regulations, they have to maintain a full-time status in the program. So a full-time status uh, is three courses per semester, and a part-time uh, registration is anywhere between one to two courses per semester. Uh, typically, again, most students complete the program in about four semesters or two, uh, two years. So they would do three courses in the first fall semester, three courses in the spring. Most students do an internship in the summer. They come back their, that second year in the fall, they take three courses and then graduate in the spring. Um, so if you are an international student in this uh, session, and if you had questions about that last semester, what can you do with that one course? Students can typically apply for a reduced course load. So it gives them that option to still take that one course in the last semester. Um, and uh, we do have also have a great uh, resource, a great office at Penn, which is the ISSS office. They deal with a lot of immigration information, policies, regulations, um, and students also, when they come to the program, they will also have a, um, a uh, ISSS advisor, which will guide them through uh, their visa, their process, any regulation, any forms, um, and, and et cetera. All right, so admission requirements. Um, I guess this is a pretty cool slide, I guess, right? A lot of students may have questions about admission requirements and what makes them a great candidate. Um, me personally, I get a lot of emails from students asking, well, I have a 4.0 GPA. I've been in, uh, in the industry for five or 10 years. Do you think I would uh, be a great candidate? Um, you know, we, we can't really uh, evaluate someone just, just by a uh, simple email or uh, we would like for them to apply. We would like them to see all the transcripts and all the recommendations letter and personal statement and, and scores. Um, and then each application is, is reviewed very carefully. But some quick tips that could help you uh, with your application and things that we look into, uh, we look into the personal statement. So the personal statement really, uh, we want to see your accomplishments. We want to see your goals. Uh, we want to see, you know, why you're interested in the program, uh, what makes you a great candidate. Um, letters of recommendations are also uh, great uh, things to have in your application and, and that we look for letters that can show your strong uh, professional abilities, but also your academic abilities. Uh, we see many letters of recommendations and uh, it is important for every applicant to also maybe um, talk to your recommenders, provide them with information that they can also help you with a recommendation, you know, as far as, you know, what makes you a good candidate, because they might, they may not know you 100%, but they may know you in some way. So we've seen recommendations where it's really short, uh, it's very brief, and that doesn't really tell us much about the student. Um, 
GRE scores. So GRE scores this year, they're optional, but we are uh, recommending them. So if you have, uh, if you're able to take the scores, we definitely recommend you, you take them. If you have previous scores and if they're valid, certainly submit them. Um, but again, GREs are optional for this year all across um, the CIS as well as the MCIT program. Um, and then, um, you know, make sure you update your resume. I mean, we, we do get um, great resumes. We see so many great accomplishments. We see um, amazing things that you have achieved, uh, but sometimes you may miss out on certain things. So try to review resume, try to make sure that it is up to date. Um, if there is something that you have done recently, or if you have uh, done a startup or a project, make sure you do include them. Um, and also the, the next point to this is also if you have done uh, coursework or experience or training that are not part of your transcript, try to include that on your resume. I think that will definitely uh, highlight a lot of great things about your portfolio and things that you have accomplished. So these numbers uh, show some, uh, some data as far as um, our current numbers in the program. Uh, so, uh, and this is for the fall of 2021. These numbers may change as we move forward. Um, but just to give you an idea as far as how many students we currently have in the program, we have 254 students in the CIS MSC. Um, first year this fall, we had about 110 students, new students. Um, we have a accelerated master program. And what that really is, it's for undergraduate CIF students who decide to continue with their master's degree. So we currently have about 57 in that program. Uh, and then we also have dual degree students with CIS. So these are students who can be in engineering. They're doing uh, another degree in engineering with a combination of CIS. There's 33 students in the dual degree. Um, and then between the spring of 2020 uh, to summer of 2021, there were about 243 graduates. So, so as, as you can see, the numbers seem, um, seem a little high, but the graduation rates are also really high. And, and that's really important when you think about retention, when you think about student enrollment, when you think about progression. Um, so our students do very well in the program, what I'm trying to say. So they come in, they take, you know, most of them take full-time status and they proceed really well. Um, the MCIT, uh, the numbers right now are at 195 total students. We had 81 in the first year. Uh, we have two in the accelerated master's program. And they do have a little higher dual degree. And that's because the MCIT um, has that option where students do not have to have the computer science background. So we have students uh, who are potentially from engineering. We also have students outside engineering. We may have MBA students who also do a dual degree, which is a really nice touch on that program. Um, and between spring 2020 to summer 2021, there have been about 119 graduates in this program. All right, so uh, yeah, I mean, how do students connect? I mean, this is, uh, this is a great uh, question that we also get uh, from prospective students. They always ask questions. Can I talk to prospective student now and just to kind of get the feeling of Penn, you know, and, and what Penn students really do and how they engage and, and you know, internships and other things. So uh, we at Penn Engineering and, and CIS and MCIT and DATS programs, we are really, really engaged. We're very student focused. Uh, what we do is, is we do a lot of events. We do them both on campus and online. Um, we do mentoring sessions, we do advising sessions, we do uh, social events. We talk about you know, uh, resume review, we talk about internships, we talk about industry talk, uh, games. We keep it fun, of course. You, know, you can't really just always talk about school, right? So, <laughs> so we do a lot of different events and try to make it fun for students, but also very engaging. We try to provide a lot of great resources. We try to connect also students with the first year and second year. Uh, the second year students, they have more courses under their belt. So they have more experience when it comes to computer science and graduate work. So we do try to connect them very closely with the first year students and help them throughout the process. Uh, so we do a lot of great things. And I think that's really stands out at Penn Engineering that I've not really seen 
um, as much in other schools or other universities out there. And, and the reason I'm saying that is because I do get that as a feedback from our current students. They really enjoy that part about pen engineering. Um, we have a Slack channel, which is really awesome. Students are super engaged. Um, it's a great communication platform. Students talk about professional development, resources, internships, you know, advising. They do events, workshops. Uh, it, it's, a, it's definitely a great, great resource to have. Um, and students are placed in that channel right from the start of the program. Um, and then we also do a few other pages. So we have the CIS Gather, which is also another technology sort of uh, platform. Uh, we have a Facebook page and we have a LinkedIn page. Um, and, and then again, you know, Penn Engineering is really, has really unique culture. Um, you know, we are, we are dedicated, you know, the faculty is super engaged. Um, you know, they're not only they teach, but they also are mentors. You know, uh, every, every student in the program will have a faculty mentor that they will work with very closely from the start of the program. Um, so our faculty is super dedicated to our students. These are some other resources that students can, uh, can connect with when they are at Penn. You know, there's, there's great resources when it comes to um, international student office, uh, there's career services, student health services. Uh, there, there's too many. This list is really just a very short, simple list, but there's so many uh, all across the college and across the university. Um, and then internships. This is a, this is a really uh, big question that we get across um, all the students, international and, and also students who are in the country. So uh, they ask about the internship. So typically the internship process, the way it works is students start their internship in their first summer. Uh, they have to complete six courses to be eligible for the internship. So they would take three courses in the fall, three courses in the spring. Then they do their internship in the summer. Um, there is also an option for a academic field of study. So what there really is, is an option for a student to extend their internship. So if a student is uh, needs a little more time to complete their internship and going through the fall semester, it is an option for international students to do that. Um, and we have a great team when it comes to the internship. We, we have uh, Tori and Elise from the RAS office who helps all of our students tremendously when it comes to the internship and other things. And then uh, there are some other individuals that we work with very closely when it comes to that process. Um, and then some of the professional experiences that students have, uh, the roles that they have been able to get and also companies, these are some of the uh, the roles and companies that we have seen, especially these are some of the, uh, from the just past summer. Uh, we, we do get a lot of students who um, <clears throat> have positions as a software developer or software engineers. Uh, top companies are Amazon, LinkedIn, Microsoft, uh, Google. Uh, the list is, is, is it's, it's, really, it's really massive, but they're really great companies, great positions. Um, this is just an example. We do also have a list on our website that has a little more specific details to this. Um, and then the career service office does a great job by collecting this data by, by doing surveys to, to students who graduate. And uh, that link has the, uh, and I apologize, that link is, is for career services, but if you go into their website, they do have graduate outcomes that show uh, specific details year by year by program and by by college um, and the career services they oh it, that's fine okay um, yeah so this yeah the previous page goes to this page so yes yeah, so um, so where do they go after they graduate so uh, these are some of the positions where students usually do go into um, a lot of the uh, positions um, Many of the students in the, in the CIS program also continue further their education. They would go for a PhD, uh, which, which is a great opportunity at Penn, or you know, if they decide to go somewhere else. Um, and then the MCIT students, they, they have obtained a large amount of positions when it comes to software engineers, uh, data scientists. Um, and we've seen a good number of students between the MBA and MCIT that they become product managers. Um, and these are some of the companies that I was talking earlier that, uh, that are the top 
hiring employers out there. Um, and that link underneath as the postgraduate outcomes shows uh, specific, um, more detailed information about students' graduations, rates when it comes to their employment, where they're working, uh, positions they got. So I would definitely recommend check that out. It's available to anyone and the career service office has that year by year as a breakdown. Um, yeah, so what are we looking for? So I, we'll definitely have, um, we'll be available to answer a lot of the questions right after this, this presentation. There's gonna be, uh, I'll be here, Christina, Dr. Sheth, Stacy. Um, some of the things that we look into are, are students who can, who have strong grades, academics, you know, that's really important. Um, we look at students who have strong scores, you know, if it's a GRE, if it's a TOEFL. Um, we also look at very carefully your professional experience, you know, and, you know, if you've done internships in the past, if you've worked in research, I think that's really important to have and to show in your resume. Uh, we we want to we want to see what you have accomplished and things that you can actually do uh, and and why you're pursuing the program. Um, so, um, and then also that that goes into the personal statement, which is also important. You know, uh, you can highlight some of the things that you have accomplished, things that are important to you, things that you know you wish to do after you graduate, um, and things that you know what you see yourself at Penn. You know, what will you do at Penn when you come here? You know, how would you make a difference? How would you make a difference? Uh, with your classmates, with faculty, and, and other students. Um, you know, we want students who have, you know, great values and qualities, such as leadership, you know, community involvement, helping other students, you know, staying connected, passion and kindness. Um, computer science is really, uh, it's a program that, uh, for my time being here, I, what I've seen is that everyone helps one another, and, and that's what makes it really unique. It's, everyone has a passion in computer science, uh, it's not really a competition, it's more of helping one another, you know, whatever you need help, you can reach out to the classmate, you can reach out to the faculty advisor, to, to Dr. Chef, to I, to Stacy, to everyone. So uh, it's really about having that passion and also that kindness. And then also, of course, it's, it's, it is challenging. So we want students to, uh, to, to take the challenge as, as a great thing and, and uh, be part of it. Thank you so much, Ridian. I think your really thorough presentation answered some of the questions that we have received in the chat and the Q&A feature. So thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to also acknowledge the other panelists who are answering some of your Q&A directly. Uh, one, we have Christine Rahal Asuna, who is one of the enrollment specialists in the graduate admissions department. So she will be um, reviewing some of your applications to make sure they are ready for evaluation. So thank you, Christine. Next, we will receive a presentation regarding the master's program in data science. And for that, we have the program administrator, Stacy Kaplan. Okay, thanks, Christina. Uh, everyone can see my screen? All right, great. So um, I just wanna thank Redian for a very thorough presentation. I think he hit on a lot of great points and I've been going through the chat. And so I'll actually try to answer some of your questions that I've seen as well. So um, I just wanna thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Stacey Kaplan. I'm the program coordinator for data science. Um, Professor Davidson, Professor Fan, and Professor Greenberg are um, the program directors for the data science program as well. Okay. So I'll start off with just going over the data science curriculum. It's a 10 CU program, and um, it starts off with two CUs of foundation, um, programming, linear algebra. You can request to waive these um, courses if you've taken them in your undergrad and done well. Um, after you matriculate, you can definitely request that. And then we have core, which is big data analytics, statistics, and then a variety of like machine learning classes. And then we have our technical um, and depth buckets. And that's a variety of classes. Um, it's pretty interdisciplinary and you can study biomedicine, social network science, data-centric programming, statistics, data analysis, and AI simulation methods, math, algorithmic foundations. And then we have um, 
independent work. So with all of these courses, I would say not only is it a very exciting time to study data, data science, it's a very exciting time to be a data scientist. Um, I have a very small program description here. It's also on our website as well. You can see um, a lot of the careers that you can go into are not just in technology and engineering, but you can go into consulting, science, policy making, literature, art, and communications. So some of the um, coursework that is pretty popular is the thesis and practicum, and that's the um, the time when you can choose to expand on some research that you're doing, or you can um, really dive deep and do a thesis. And this could be a two CU um, semesters worth of work. And we generally recommend that you take at least one of your courses in the data domain before starting. So many of our students spend a whole year doing um, independent studies. And some of the data sets that um, they they work on could be, you know, anything from like sports statistics to like Reddit dumps. Um, if you're really interested in, you know, studying the sort of natural language processing of a movie, you, or you want to go right into like medical imaging, really, it's you know, the world is your oyster. If you connect with um, faculty, or if you're really interested in a certain type of research and you can apply your data science toolkit to that, um, it's a great opportunity to study that. So some of our research partners, um, the Warren Center for Network and Data Science, there's some really great courses that come out of there. Um, Professor Kearns, who runs the center, is teaching a really great course this spring on data ethics. Um, we have the Price Lab for Digital Humanities. Um, Biomedical Informatics, Annenberg Center. Um, there's a lot of collaboration between the Wharton Customer Analytics Group and the, um, the Budget Model Group at Wharton as well. So our um, student composition, uh, we have a large class and that's great. So we have 241 students right now. We have 105 first year students, 68 second year students and ready and mentioned the accelerated masters. We have a large group of them and they come from all over the university, like the college, um, maybe they're studying economics. Um, we have some history majors. Um, we have uh, Wharton students who are studying finance and statistics. And then we also have some dual master students who are maybe um, collab like doing degrees also, or sorry, majors also in mechanical engineering, mechanical engineering or computer science. Um, between spring of 2018 and, and summer of 2021, we've had uh, 164 graduates of the data science program. So our fall cohort is very diverse. Um, I'm really proud to say we have students from all over the world. Um, and you can see uh, the countries that are represented from our fall cohort class. Um, and so that actually, I'll just go right into internships with that. Um, so many of our students are international students. And if you complete one year of coursework, um, that's six CUs in the United States, you're able to apply for your CPT, which is really exciting. Our students have gotten great jobs that often lead to full-time work once they graduate. And here are just some of the most recent um, roles and companies that students have worked at. And, um, we also have a LinkedIn group so that if you know you matriculate and you're really interested in working at Google, you can join our LinkedIn group and then you have access to alumni and also current students and you can just like message students and say, hey, I saw you had like a great internship this past summer. Can we grab a coffee and chat? And it's just a great way to um, you know connect with current students and also learn what kind of opportunities are out there during your first semester. And um, I'm not sure if this presentation is, is going to be sent as a PDF, but I would definitely just Google career services at Penn and really explore the website. Um, Redian had mentioned, you know, they have great like outcome reports. Um, they haven't posted 2021 yet, but I think it'll come out pretty soon. And um, that's also where you can find all the career fair information as well and all the companies that are invited. I think I saw a question, um, does, engineering have a specific data science and, and CIT career fair. And we don't 
have a specific one, but we have we work very closely with our partners at um, the career services and we work closely to have companies that appeal to our students. And so you'll find that there is like an engineering day. And so there'll be a lot of companies that cover all the disciplines at Penn Engineering. So here is some career paths um, for recent grads. And um, this, was, this was surveyed from spring 2021 um, from 49 students. We have some data for 32 students. Um, so you can see some of the companies that students have gone to work at and then some of their career titles. Um, I don't think there's anything shocking here, uh, but we do have some students who do pursue PhDs. So that definitely is a track. Um, and it, we might not have had it in our last class, but I know we've had some PhD students in the past and maybe Christina can confirm. <laughs> so this is um, a pretty new initiative and I'm really proud of it. I think it's a great way for students to learn um, from their you know, experienced second year students. We have these data science uh, student mentors and you can go on the website and look at everyone's profile. I, I also think it's good to learn too about the types of students that we have and everyone's background. Um, we have a variety of student backgrounds. Some come from the military, um, some come from like non-traditional uh, STEM programs. Um, we have some students who worked in industry following graduation. So you can see there's a lot of variety in our student um, cohort. And so these students are paired up with, um, you know, about 10 to 12 current first year students. And they're there to answer questions about coursework, um, you know, how to get an internship, maybe the best restaurant in Philadelphia, um, you know, what's going on with this class, what's going on with this teacher. It's just a great way to get connected right away so that you're not alone when you um, matriculate and, you know, Penn, Penn is a big place. So it's good to have a friend right off the bat. And these are other um, groups and resources primarily in, the data science, but you'll see there's this Penn Data Science Club, and that is um, that's open for the whole university. So it's it's um, it's a community of students, undergrads and graduates from all different majors, and they organize hackathons. They invite like um, professional speakers to come. So it's not just within engineering. It's also not run by faculty. It's it's really a student based club. The Data Science General Assembly is a student, uh, is for data science students, and it you're elected, you elect each other. And then Professor Greenberg, Greenberg, who is the projects director for the practicum and thesis project, helps oversee it as well as myself. Um, and they help do social events, um, they collect feedback on courses. Um, they're basically your like go-to folks um, for any complaints or anything that's going great. Um, they're just trying to help improve the program. And then we have like your social media groups, Facebook. Um, we have a Piazza group, which is pretty similar to what Redian mentioned, like the Slack group. It's just a way to post questions. Um, we put jobs there. It's like a conversation message board. Um, and then we saw the student mentors. And then we have the LinkedIn student and alumni group. Um, that's good to see where everyone's going after they graduate and like where they're moving to as well. Okay, so I have two more slides left and these are really important because I think this is why you're here as well. <laughs> so what are the, some of the things we're looking for? Um, so very similar to what Redian said, um, we look for applicants with very strong academics, but we, not just from STEM, we look for all your coursework. So, you know, if you're really interested in pursuing data science, but maybe you studied history, but maybe you dabbled in a little computer programming. Don't worry, like these things are good. As long as you show like strong math, some strong quantitative abilities, um, we're really like open to a variety of backgrounds. We tend to get mostly computer science, math, statistics um, applicants, but that's not to say that, you know, if you have a different background, don't apply. So um, resumes are really important update them, put all of your professional and internship and research experience on there, um, just to show us like how your goals are clear to pursue data science related um, work. Um, test scores, if you have them, include them. And if you don't, that's okay. We look at your application holistically. 
Um, we look for students who are going to add value and diversity to the program, uh, leadership, community spirit, and kindness. And then there's many others. So just put your best foot forward in your personal statement. Um, again, the personal statement, tell us your story. Why are you interested in data science? Um, why are you choosing pen engineering? And maybe provide some highlight of your coursework and projects. You don't have to you know, write three pages on your favorite project, we'll get it. But um, it's really important that we see you as a holistic person and what your goals are. So letters of recommendation, unfortunately, uh, you don't have that much control over what is said, but you do have control over who you pick. So look for folks, look for faculty that are gonna write strong letters for you that demonstrate not just your academic abilities, but demonstrate who you are as a person. If you're likable, your leadership, persistence, honesty, all of these strengths are really important. Um, with your transcripts, um, sometimes you do other coursework like boot camps and training. So just include that on your resume. Uh, for GREs, it's optional, as you know. Um, we will accept GMAT, um, but uh, you know if you don't have these scores, that's okay. And then for TOEFL, we, across the board, ask for a minimum of 100 is recommended. Okay, so that's all. Thank you so much for your time. And if I emailed you, um, it's, you know, it's great to get to know you. And thanks for um, showing up today. And I'll leave it up to Christina and the team for Q&A. Thanks so much, Stacey. That was a great presentation. And again, I think you answered most of the questions that were in the chat. So thank you. I would be remiss before I move on to moderating the Q&A if I did not acknowledge Professor Sheath, who is here. Um, he is the faculty director for the master's program in computer and information science. Thank you for being here and thank you for answering some of the questions in the chat. I'm sure there will be some more questions that are directed to you or that you can answer um, most efficiently. So thank you for being here. All right, so um, before we move on, I do want to acknowledge another thing. Um, Dr. Liu asked me to let you all know that very soon in 2024, we will have a new data science building known as the Amy Gutman Hall. So for those of you who are interested in data science or intend to do some research related to data science, you may have a new facility to utilize. So this new facility, will be just a few blocks away from the Penn Engineering Complex, and it has about 124,000 um, square feet. And again, it'll be ready in 2024. So we hope that you will be here so that you can witness the opening of those doors. So thank you again. And also, we had some questions related to graduate admissions. Um, so I will try to answer those now. One, I want to apologize on behalf of admissions. Uh, we had an issue with the GPA STEM calculator on our graduate application form. You will notice I did send an email out to all of you that we have removed that section from our graduate application. So you no longer have to try to calculate your STEM GPA in order to um, submit an application. So if you still, for some reason, see the, G the STEM GPA on your application form, you can go ahead and completely ignore it and move on to the next question and submit your application. So I wanted to make sure that was clear. So again, thank you all for being here. I will now go into answer some of your questions. So starting with the ones that I can answer, <laughs> I will say that um, a lot of people asked about letters of recommendation and you guys intend to apply by November 1st, but you are concerned that your letters of recommendation will not be in by that time. Um, in your case, it may be more likely that you apply by the February 1st deadline. And the reason I say that is if we do not have all of your required application materials, we cannot um, submit you to faculty and program administrators for evaluation. So in order for your application to be marked as complete and to be evaluated, we have to have all required materials. Um, and then with that being said, I want to highlight again, November 1st is the early decision deadline for the three programs we've discussed today. If you apply by November 1st, you can expect to receive a decision sometime in January. And with that, if you receive your decision in January, we want you guys to confirm whether or not you accept the offer of admission by February 15th. All right, so I think those are all the admissions related questions. So now I'm just gonna ask perhaps um, Dr. Sheath, if you can answer this next question. Uh, could you talk about the difference between the master's program in computer and information science and the master's program in data science and why someone who has a background in computer, computer science might choose one or the other? 
Sure. Thanks, Christina. Happy to answer that. So uh, there is a lot of overlap between the two programs and we get a lot of computer science students who end up taking data science courses, for example, and a lot of data science students who take computer science courses. So my suggestion for a lot of this is just for a minute, forget about the program specifically and just think about like in an ideal world, if there were no constraints, like which 8, 10, 12 courses would you take? And once you do that, that will help you get a little bit of a sense of what your interests are, because I think a lot of times we think about the rules and the restrictions and the requirements and don't really think about what you're actually interested in. So once you do that and then you can go back and see, okay, which program does it fit better? And it turn, it might turn out that one program is a better fit than the other, or it might turn out that both are the same. All right, great. Thanks for that. Uh, we have another question that perhaps uh, Stacy or Ridian can answer. Is there a career fair specifically for um, students in the data science and computer and information technology programs? Oh, you know, I can answer that. Uh, we During the pandemic, we did have a virtual data science career week. It was more of, we invited a few of hiring managers to give some Zoom talks. Um, we had like, Bain Analytics, we had Facebook come and give some um, talks and, and that aligned with some of their recruiting. But as far as like the major career fairs that's really run out of career services and they don't do specific um, data science and CIS, but their engineering career fair does have a lot of tech companies and maybe ready in or um, Professor Sheth, if you have any feedback on that. Uh, no, I don't think so. So I think the difference is that we do have certain things that tend to be like tech or CS focus. So for example, when we do things like pen apps, there are a lot of companies that will come and be part of pen apps and they sort of do soft recruiting, which tends to be like tech related. So I think it's, there is an engineering career fair that's mostly engineering. And then we'll have like these events that are more computer science related. Yeah, I, I would agree with both of you. Uh, same thing as Dr. Shatz just mentioned and Stacy, uh, we do have the engineering career fair, which is usually in September. Um, but then uh, we do also have student panels. We have students who went through the program, they're working for these great companies, uh, alumni, I should say. They, they do come back and they provide talks to our current students, students who maybe are working at Google, Microsoft, Facebook, uh, which are great sessions to have for the current students and to kind of you know, help them and motivate them through the industry out there. All right, great, thank you. So another question I have, um, do any of your programs have an industrial affiliates program? I'm not quite sure what they mean. I, I assume that this person is asking, do you have any partnerships in industry? Sure, I can take a crack at this. So uh, there is no official program. So there are some places that do like co-ops, for example, but we don't do that. Uh, what we do have is a few different options instead. So we have something called an academic field study option. So what this basically means is normally when you're a full-time student, you're taking classes. But with this academic field study, what you can do is you can work full-time and take classes part-time. And there are like a few different permutations of this. And there are people who've done that. It's typically a way for someone to do like an internship in the summer, for example, and then extend it into the fall semester and still take some classes at the same time. So we have this, uh, in terms of industry, I think we get a lot of like connections to industry through a couple of different things. So career services, of course, is fantastic. And there's a lot of options there, but then even with the local like Philadelphia community, there are a lot of companies that will come and do recruiting events. Over the last like year or two, it's been a little tricky with COVID and not having like in-person stuff, but we are hoping some of that will resume in the near future. All right, thank you. So another question is about where can um, someone find the option to waive foundational courses? Uh, maybe Stacy or N or Ridian, if you could include those links in um, the chat feature, that would be really helpful. So it's a good question. We don't um, review these requests until a student matriculates. Yeah. Thanks for that clarity. Yeah, sure, no problem. <laughs> At least for data science, I, I don't. I assume it's the same for other programs. Okay, great. 
Um, so there's another question. If this person is admitted into the MCIT program, would they get an opportunity to do research work under any professor of interest in the CIS department? I can answer this. So even though I'm not related to MCIT these days, I used to teach some of the core MCIT classes a few years ago. So, and I'm, so I'm pretty familiar with MCIT. So in general, yes, MCIT is still part of the computer science department. So you're sort of like a first class citizen in some ways of the department. So in general, with all of these programs, you're always welcome to do research. The only thing that changes is whether you do research sort of for fun, whether you do it for like getting paid as a research assistant or whether you do it for course credit. So certain programs will allow options like course credit, but if not, you might have to do one of the other options. So that part, I'm not really sure about, but I'm like 99% sure that for MCIT, you can do it as part of course credit. Uh, for CIS, you can definitely do it for course credit. All right, great. There's another question. Perhaps you can answer it, Professor. Um, someone uh, wanted to know, is it recommended that they complete the master's in computer and information technology if they would like to pursue a doctoral degree in computer and information science? Uh, I don't quite understand the question. Uh, maybe if this person is yours, they can like reframe. So if you're trying to do a PhD in CS, are you saying that you, I guess is the option between finishing an MCIT or not finishing an MCIT? I'm not quite sure that they didn't provide much context, but the first thing I thought to share is that you are not required to have a master's degree in order to apply and be admitted to one of our doctoral programs. Um, so if you're somebody, perhaps, let's say you're someone who does not have an undergraduate background in computer science, uh, I guess this person is looking for a way to um, have coursework and research experience in order to enter the doctoral program. What would you advise in that situation? I see. So in that situation, what I would say is you have broadly two options. Most PhD programs, the way admissions work is it tends to be decentralized, although there are certain places that do centralize. So for most people, what they're looking for is, do you have the skills and the background to do research and to contribute to this lab, to this group? And a lot of programs will let you get a master's along the way. So that might be potentially a good fit. Other programs might say you need a master's or we need to see some background in, like for example, if you want to do research in machine learning, they might say we want to see some background in machine learning before we admit you as a PhD student. So that I think varies a lot from place to place. So it might be better to check with that specific group or that specific university on what they expect. Great answer, thank you. <laughs> Um, so another question is, if you're applying to one of the master's programs we discussed today, is it recommended that you reach out to faculty members if you mention their names and show interest in their research in the personal statement? Hi, I think I responded to that, but I'll just I'll, um, communicate it broadly. So this is a great question because um, if you're interested in faculty research, I would say when you matriculate, definitely set up an appointment to talk with them or, or email them um, or even show up to their office hours because sometimes they, they have openings in their labs. Um, sometimes they need help you know, uh, with their research groups. Um, and so I've had students who expressed interest in working in research and one student is working in the lab this fall. Um, I think he just went to an office hour and was hired right on the spot. So. I'd say, go for it, <laughs> but not before you matriculate, <laughs> I would say, because you might not get an answer and it's, it's nothing personal. It's just, you know, there's a lot of students. Great. And Stacy, this may be another one for you. Did the data science program admit humanity background students in the past years? We have. Um, and but you know to be honest students who maybe didn't study stem you know majors but they have shown that they've done like self-taught you know java or python or they've taken some coursework um you know maybe they've taken some math classes some probability classes but their major wasn't stem um and and then they don't you know waive the foundation courses it's it's just a great segue into the program they can start off by taking intro to programming and linear algebra and get the foundations they need before moving on to the core classes 
And we do have a student at the School of Medicine right now, actually, which is interesting. So she's working part-time at CHOP and she's taking classes and she did not have a computer science background and she's doing quite well. That's great to hear. I didn't know that. Wow, impressive. <laughs> so I guess this is for either of the program administrators. What is the maximum number of courses or credits that can be transferred into a master's program? Uh, so I can say for, for C MCIT and CIS, the maximum is about two courses that we will look into. Um, they have to be within five years. They have to be uh, a graduate course uh, and they have to be with uh, a B or better final grade. All right, great. And I see a question that um, I can probably jump in and answer, but if anyone wants to add on, please do. Uh, someone said, I'm going to apply to the computer and information science program. I saw on the website that it allows students several, seven years to complete the program. Is it also true for international students? So I will warn you that if you are an international student and you are on a student visa, um, there are certain expectations about your course load for each semester. So um, international students, from my understanding, must be full-time students. So that means you have to enroll in at least three graduate credits per academic semester. Uh, Stacy or Ridian, do you wanna add more to that? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, it's the same for both Stacy and I and other programs. So they have to be full-time, like you said, Christina, they have to maintain three courses per semester. Um, there, there is, in some cases, we have seen students where if they have a personal situation or a family situation and they're international, they can take a leave of absence. They would have to leave the country and they would have to work with the ISSS office as far as the leave of absence, their visa. And then when they come back, we would also work with them again to maintain a full-time status. But while they're here in the program, they have to be full-time. They have to take three courses per semester. And just to add to what Radian said, a few examples of when people have to take leave. So it's been for things like family or health reasons. There have been people who had to do military service, for example, for certain countries. So depending on what your situation is, that's what the seven-year rule really is for. Thank you for the clarification, everyone. Um, so I'm going to go for maybe two more questions, and then we will move on to the last segment of today's um, webinar. But the first question is, do the core um, courses in the master's program for computer and information technology allow other students in, or are they exclusively for MCIT students? There are exceptions. There are definitely exceptions for students, especially in the fall semester. Students can, um, can request to register for the CIT 591, which is the entry course. Um, there, there is a process that we do uh, in, internally in, in our programs where students have to request for that course. There is a wait list. Uh, we want to make sure that our MCIT students have the priority for those courses as, as they need those courses to move forward to the spring semester. But it is an option uh, that, you know, other students can try to get into those courses by doing the wait list registration process. And um, the three courses in the fall, they do connect with the spring courses. So for example, if a student takes CIT 591 in the fall semester, then they would take CIT 594 in the spring semester. Um, so um, yeah. All right, and final question before we move on to the last segment is for the master's in computer and information technology applicants, if one hasn't taken many quantitative courses and wasn't able to take the GRE, will the AP calculus uh, be sufficient? Should that be included in the resume? So I, I will say we, oftentimes when I do recruitment, I tell people um, that we, made the GRE scores optional, but if you do not have a sufficient background in the graduate program of interest, we strongly do recommend you submit GRE scores. So Stacy or Ridian, do you wanna add anything to that? Uh, 
Christine, I think I, I lost my, <laughs> I was looking at the questions and I forgot the question that you, you can you can repeat the question? I'm so sorry. Okay, if you haven't taken many quantitative courses and you weren't able to take the GRE, will AP calculus be sufficient? So I guess if you're someone who doesn't have a, a um, CS background, you're intending to apply, apply to MCIT, but you are not planning to take the GRE, what do you recommend? That's that's a good question. Uh, whoever asked that question, you know, it's it's a really good question, and we get that question a lot when it comes to GREs. Um, so we look at the entire package of the application. As Stacy mentioned earlier, we look at all the courses you have taken, uh, math courses, science courses, uh, in any field, um, and then we look into your personal statement. We look into your recommendations letter. We look at your resume, your experience, uh, what you can bring to the program, uh, what makes your application unique. Um, so uh, GREs are optional. So if, if you are not able to take it, depending where you are, the location where you are, uh, that, that is okay, that's fine. Uh, but if you can take the GREs, we recommend that you do take it. Um, but as far as the review process, everyone will be reviewed equally all across the board for all the applications. That's great, thank you, Ridian. Um, does anyone else have anything they wanted to add that might be helpful to your applicants? I'm enjoying answering all these questions, <laughs> but I would say um, if you didn't get an answer to your question, I apologize, Ready, and I'm sure this, you all want answers, but it's hard to, to answer everything, but feel free to email us um, and we'll try to answer you personally. Um, I know it's a busy time right now, and I know the deadline's November 1st, so we'll do the best we can to get back to everyone. Yeah, our program administrators are perhaps the hardest working people in pen engineering, so we thank you for being here. I'm just gonna close out today's session with some basic tips. Um, so you heard from Ridian, he went very thoroughly through our um, at admissions requirements, so you know what documents are required to complete an application. I will again say, if you want to apply by the early decision deadline of November 1, your application will not be complete if we do not receive all the required materials by no November 1. Okay, so um, the application will technically close by Eastern Standard Time at 2 a.m., actually, on November 2nd, because uh, CollegeNet, which is the company responsible for our admissions database, is located on the West Coast. So just for clarity, a lot of people ask, is it 12 a.m. on November 1st? So hopefully that answers some of your questions. Here are some basic admissions tips. Um, I know uh, we went over these a lot. So make sure you're intentional about who you ask to be your recommender. You don't want a faculty member who's just gonna say, yes, that person was in my class and they got a B or they got an A. You ideally want someone who you've done some um, experience, had some practical experiences with, perhaps you've done research with them, perhaps they previously recommended you for internship experiences. So they know your capabilities as a student and where you want to go after your undergraduate experience. Um, I would say, thoroughly review um, the research that some of our faculty is doing. You do have the opportunity on your application to list out uh, research concentration areas. If that is of interest to you, you can also list out faculty who you would like to be an advisor. Um, I would also say while applying, uh, make sure that you get people to review your application materials for you. I will say one of the most frustrating things to read is when you see a personal statement that says, I've always wanted to go to Penn State University, or I've always wanted to study aerodynamics. If you are not thoroughly reviewing our website and our research interests, and if you haven't gotten our name right, then of course that doesn't um, really bode well. So I would strongly encourage you to have people review your materials before you submit them. And thank you for being here to look into open house or to um, attend this information session to learn more. At this time, we are not able to offer fee waivers uh, for attending this event. We thank you for being here, but unfortunately, that's not available for this event. I do wanna talk about um, just one opportunity for funding that uh, may be of interest to you. So we have the Dean's Master's Scholarship or Fellowship. This is newly established. And in order to be eligible for this fellowship, you must be a US citizen or permanent resident. 
You could be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident who's first generation and low income, or you can be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident who meets one of the underrepresented ethnic groups as listed here. The benefit of this scholarship program is that you receive $15,000 towards your first semester of full-time study. So you must matriculate and start as a full-time student in order to receive this fund. Uh, we also have something called the Masters to PhD Bridge Program that we're really proud about. This program is particularly for those who are interested in research and plan to pursue a PhD, but perhaps you haven't had enough research experience or your profile is not strong enough to apply to a PhD program directly. So the eligibility criteria is the same as what was listed for the previous scholarship. In this opportunity, those who are admitted as bridge program um, students will be admitted as master students. They'll have the opportunity to complete their master's programs within the first two years of matriculation or enrollment here at Penn Engineering. And during the time that you're completing your master's requirement, you'll also have opportunity to work with faculty on some research. So that will help to really strengthen your profile when you go to apply to the PhD program. So the benefits of this opportunity is that um, students who are bridge participants are the only master's students who are fully funded. So that means we pay fully for your tuition to complete the master's program. We will also provide you with a $25,000 stipend each year of the master's program because it supplements your investment in yourself, your investment in completing your master's program requirements, as well as taking on additional research opportunities to strengthen your profile. So I encourage you all to please stay connected with graduate admissions. I know in the chat, people asked about what's the link for YouTube. Thank you, Christine, for providing that link. I will also send you all an email with the recording link um, probably by Monday. So you'll have that link in your email uh, for those of you who had to leave earlier, for those of you who would like to review some of the information that was um, we presented today. So I'll allow, um, I thank you for being here. I'll allow my panelists, if you guys have any final things to say, please do share, unmute yourself and share them before we close out. Thanks, everyone. It was nice talking to you and answering some of your questions. Definitely contact us if you have other questions that we can help with. I'm looking forward to connecting with you in the future. Thank you, everyone. And we look forward to reviewing your applications. Take care.